take a moment to welcome everybody here to MacArthur Library. My name is Melanie. I'm the Adult Services Manager. So I do the upstairs parts of the library. Um, and a very, very warm welcome to Karen. Odin. Odin. We went through this last year. Is it Odin or Odin? And because the audiobooks, I think, say Odin. Oh. About the Norse god who ripped an eye out of his head in exchange for power. Odin. Just <laughs> Okay. So Karen Odin is here today. <laughs> um, so we've known each other for a couple of years now, and I feel like I can finally call her friend, which I think is really neat. And the beauty of being Karen's friend is that you get to travel on these amazing journeys with her. And you get to meet this wonderful cast of characters. And this evening, we even got to meet a couple of authors who are joining us tonight, Bruce Coffin and Barbara Ross. So say, I feel like I'm in the room with all these celebrities. It's very exciting. Um, so I'm also delighted to share a brief professional bio with you. After a career in publishing and marketing at places like McGraw-Hill and Christie's Auction House, Karen earned her PhD in English literature from New York University, writing her dissertation on Victorian railway disasters and the origins of PTSD diagnosis. Afterwards, she taught classes at, on the Victorian novel at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and served as an editor for the academic journal Victorian Literature and Culture. As a result, once she turned to fiction, she camped out in 1870s London. Karen's first novel, the Lady in the, a Lady in the Smoke, about a young woman in a railway crash of 1874, was a USA Today bestseller. And her next two mysteries, A Dangerous Duet and A Trace of Deceit, won awards for historical mystery and historical fiction, historical mystery and historical fiction. Her fourth novel, which I think is my favorite, I've decided. I can't, it's between that and, and A Lady in the Smoke, but that's besides the point. Um, Down a Dark River was still fresh when she was here last year. And the sequel, Under a Veil Moon, was released last fall and has been nominated for the Agatha, which is a huge deal. Uh, the Lefty, the Anthony, also a huge deal, and Best Historical Novel this year, and was an Oprah Daily pick, which I got very excited about. We were, we were all emailing about it. Um, a transplant from the New York, Air, New York City area, Karen lives in Arizona with her family where she loves to hike in the desert, and she got a taste of me in hiking today. But without further ado, we're a warm welcome for Karen Odin. So thank you everybody for being here. Um, I had, honestly, I had so much fun last year that I thought, okay, I need to come back. So, okay, I'm gonna put this thing on. So I'd like to thank Melanie um, for her very warm welcome and that outrageously perfect sign out front about the authoress. Um, <laughs> that is all her. Um, and also a huge thanks to um, my cousin, Kate, who's really one of my favorite people on the planet. And she's the assistant librarian here. And she was the one who introduced Melanie and me um, and has done everything to kind of organize this. And it's just a pleasure to be back. Um, really, one of the things that no one tells you uh, when you're getting into the writing career. And I think, we so now we've got three, right? Okay, Julia, you got to wave. <laughs> Barbara. <laughs> so we have three other authors here who will probably testify to this, is that you meet amazing people being a writer. You meet people who love books, who love history, who care about the human condition, and who are out to support each other. It tends to be a very supportive, kind of gregarious group. And so I always feel very lucky to have found this. I have been studying and writing about the Victorian period for nearly 25 years, which makes me feel really old um, because that's not where my career began. It did begin in marketing and advertising. And um, like anything you do for 25 years, it changes you. Like having kids kicks out the walls of your heart, bringing you joy and challenges you never could have foreseen. 
spending time in Victorian England and writing these five books was an experience of intellectual unfolding and emotional discovery that I couldn't have anticipated. So today I'm gonna to be sharing some of my writing journey, um, what drew me to the Victorian period and why I've stayed there for all five of my books. And then toward the end, I'll be talking about why I think historical novels are important today and the kinds of cultural work that they can do. Part one, finding my way to the Victorians. So one of my strongest memories of reading as a young adult was not in fact at a public library. It was at my grandmother's house. My grandparents, I grew up in Rochester, New York. Is anybody here from upstate New York? <laughs> and um, we, so uh, uh, Rochester, New York is kind of known for having 180 inches of snow a year. And so um, we, uh, we lived in kind of like a suburb of Rochester and my grandparents lived in a suburb of a suburb of a suburb of Rochester, Virgin, New York. It was a small town with one blinking yellow stop light in all directions. And my grandfather had built his house out there. It was kind of a long sprawling ranch. And uh, especially during the winters, my younger brother and all of my younger siblings would go out into the pine forests behind the house and run around and do snowmobiles and snow fights and everything. My parents would go into the living room with my grandparents and some other relatives and play a very raucous game of bridge with a lot of yelling. And I would sit in my grandmother's library. It was a U-shaped room and a floor to ceiling bookshelves. There was a stone fireplace and there was one of those 1970s recliners with gold fur. Remember those? Okay, they went forward and back like this, okay? That's, so I would usually bring my own book and I would sit in that chair, that was my, that was my spot and I would read while everybody else you know, doing their things. Well, apparently sometime, I think I was probably around 10 and I, um, I usually, it was like, I think I'd finished reading my book or maybe I hadn't forgotten to bring one or something like that. And so I look over and I see this, this shelf of very colorful books of my grandmother's. And so I thought, oh, well, that looks interesting. I pull one down and I think it was called The Dangerous Duke. And I open it and there's a very pretty girl on the cover with long flowing hair and a pretty dress. And there's a man, he doesn't have a shirt on, but something must've happened to his shirt. And I thought, oh, well, I'll start reading this. Okay, uh, little did I know. I, I, this is called a bodice ripper in the industry. Like I didn't know what this thing was. So anyways, I'm reading, I start, I start reading this, this, this book and my grandmother walks by the open door on the way to the kitchen. And she's very proper. And she, oh, she kind of, you know, hustles in and picks up the book and, no, 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 you don't want to read that. And she directs me toward a shelf that has Mary Stewart, Victoria Holt, and Daphne du Maurier. And these books, with their combination of a young woman thrown into extraordinary circumstances, mystery, romance, and exotic location like Greece, these books laid down tracks in my brain that never really went away, certainly not for my first three books. So I graduated high school and I went to Cornell and I thought that I was going to go to med school. And so I was taking all the biology classes until I got to a class, it was an animal physiology lab and I had to do a live dissection on an anesthetized rabbit with three lab partners. And they were all excited, they wanted to stay late. I wanted to get out of there. And I realized I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to go to med school. And I was taking this English class that I was really loving. And so really like midstream, I kind of turned my boat and I finished the bio degree, but went on to get the English degree, um, applied to grad schools, got into the PhD program at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and went, but I was 21 years old and I was a young 21. And I was also pining for my boyfriend who later became my husband. He was in San Diego. He was, he'd gone ROTC undergrad and he was doing his Navy work out in San Diego. And I was also in over my head. Um, I was in classes with people who were talking about post-colonial theory and the work of Edward Said and um, Michel Foucault's epistemology and his work on discourse and, and the, the difference between structuralism and deconstruction. And I, I was there because I, I liked books. I, was, I really was, I was in over my head, but I, I finished the masters and I got myself out of there and got to San Diego where I got married and then bounced around for about seven years in marketing, advertising, publishing, and at Christie's Auction House, which is what came in handy for my third book, which was set in the art and auction world. 
anyway, but at the end of this kind of bouncing around period, my husband was at Columbia for his MBA. He finished and he started going into the workforce. And I said, well, I think I'd like to go back to grad school. And this time I was 28. I had a little bit more of a clue what was going on. I knew what I was interested in. And I was lucky enough to land a very nice fellowship at NYU. And the very first semester that I was there, I took this novel course, a Victorian novel co course called The Dead Mother. And the idea was that we have all these orphans running around in Victorian England, right? We have Jane Eyre, we have Pip, we have um, Oliver Twist, we have Daniel Deronda. And the professor basically read this as a, a trope that suggested a cultural shift between 18th and 19th century England. Because in 18th century England, your class, your standing, your education, the money was all inherited from your parents. And in 19th century, with the rise of industry, that was no longer the case. You could be a self-made man, and I use the term man advisedly, but you could make your money through newspapers or railways or manufacturing or shipping or something. So the orphan really became a trope for the Victorian who didn't have to rely on his parents anymore. Now, I thought this was a really cool way to read literature. Not only did you get to sit around and read all these wonderful Victorian novels, but there was a framework to kind of put it into a historical context and see the kind of cultural work that a book could do. And I thought this is really neat. Well, I got lucky because NYU had a very deep bench of Victorian talent. Um, so I was reading, there were four professors who were all working in Victorian England. So I read poems, I read Charles Darwin, I read Henry Morton Stanley, I read religious tracts, I read parliamentary reports, I read lots of novels, lots of nice big fat novels. And it was fascinating to me and full of um, sort of like charm, partly because there was so much change. And part of the reason there was so much change is because the Victorian period was long. Let's see if I can get this to work. Is that not working? Let's see, is that working? Yeah, it's it's it should be in there. Yeah. Yeah. I may. I may went to sleep. Yeah. There we go. So yeah. Okay. Oh, there. Now it's now it's working. There you go. Got it. Okay. So this is Queen Victoria. She was 18 when she took the throne in 1837. She died in 1901. So she was queen for almost 64 years. Um. But I remember re reading that and it, it, it's striking me because I have a 19-year-old son who can barely run a dishwasher and here she is helping, like, he's helping run a country. <laughs> and uh, I mean, she had advisors and everything, but she was helping. Anyway, so um, so one of the reasons is that, you know, one of the things about the, the Victorian era is you cannot make generalizations about it. And in fact, scholars tend to break it up into early, middle, and high Victorian because 64 years is a long time um, and you can't make generalizations for the same reason we couldn't make generalizations about the United States that would hold true from 1959 to present day. Obviously, we've undergone what, you know, Shakespeare and the Tempest famously called a sea change, a radical um, reformation and change um, for our whole entire culture that, you know, affected everything. Um, for us, it was the Internet. And for the Victorians, it was the railways. So in 1830, Robert Stevenson's The Rocket, um, this, is, this was his, um, uh, his steam engine, made the first commercial passenger train trip from Liverpool to Manchester. It was all of 30 miles. Um, thousands of people showed up for it, including the king, the prime minister, um, the Duke of Wellington, um, and, and also William Huskinson, who was a member of parliament for Liverpool. However, people didn't understand that trains couldn't stop on a dime, and he stepped in front of it and was killed. So, so you know, so people even from the very earliest days, people were looking at railways as this, you know, immense sign of progress, but also something that would bring tragedy 
and trauma in its wake. So this is the rocket. Here's another picture of the rocket, same year. So this gives you an idea what, how people felt about the railway, the worry and the anxiety and the chaos that they thought that this was going to bring. Um, like you take a look like this man here, I mean, he's actually cut in half. And um, this, is a, this is a woman who's like, you know, hair and everything is flying off of her head. And um, it suggests the, the, the fear and, and, you know, when I was trying to figure out why, even in the 1830s, people would be scared about the railways. You think about this, and the steam engine, you know, for many years, was associated with factories and coal mines and the working classes. Like, it was kind of sequestered away from culture. But now, all of a sudden, you have a steam engine being brought in very close contact with people from all different classes. I mean, the people who were riding the train were literally inhaling the air that the steam engine exhaled. It's very close. And, um, and with this came a lot of fears about bodies, about what, what was gonna happen to people's bodies. Um, the chief ones were because a train at the blinding speed of 30 miles an hour was six times as fast as a stagecoach, um, people were afraid that it would cause um, people to um, go deaf or have a miscarriage. Um, if you exceeded speeds of 30 miles an hour, it was thought that you would become impotent. Um, that, <laughs> that traveling through tunnels could actually make you go blind or insane or even suicidal. And there were also fears that the railways would change everything. And in fact, they did. Um, just to give you an idea about the rapid growth. So this is the railway in 1836. Here it is in 1891. We haven't even hit 1901. We've got another 10 years in Victoria's reign. But this is what it looks like. And you think about the way we think about our internet, the web. This became a web across Britain. And it did change everything. I mean, changed people's ideas of what they could do and so on. So let's say that you live 200 miles outside of London in a nice house. You want to come in for the season. Formerly, that would take you seven days stopping and like bouncing over those toll gate roads and stopping and staying in those sometimes seedy little, you know, inns. And now it took a day. Um, telegraphs grew up along with the railway. So instead of information taking a week to two weeks to get from one place to another, it happened in minutes. Um, railways altered the way mail was delivered, the foods people ate, how they spent their leisure time, how books were consumed, and the sort of professions that people could have. It also altered ideas of time and national identity. So before the railways in the 1830s, England, the island, had multiple time zones. Now, Greenwich Mean Time had been established in 1650. But Bristol was 10 minutes off of Greenwich Mean Time, and Cardiff was three minutes off of that. And you can understand why this doesn't work with railways. I, I mean, this is you, they had some spectacular near misses. Um, and so basically, by the 1840s, the Railway Commission is like, everybody's got to be on Greenwich Mean Time. Every railway has to be on Greenwich Mean Time. And interestingly, all of the public clocks in London by 1847 were set to railway time. That's what they called it, railway time, because Greenwich Mean Time wasn't actually legally adopted until the 1880s. So this, just to give you an idea of like just how deep and systemic this was, the, the, the changes of the railway. They also brought about a new kind of injury um, because they were not safe. Like any new technology, the regulation tended to lag a bit. So part of the problem was that these railways were begun by separate joint stock companies, publicly held companies with boards, and these people were not talking to each other. So some of them were building railways on narrow gauges, and some of them were on wide gauges. And some of them said, sure, it's okay to have a open flame lantern in your railway car. And some of them said, no, 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 we can't have that. And most of them did not have what they call continuous breaks. So now, like present day, we have, like, if we have to stop a train suddenly, all of the cars have a brake, so they all break together. But back then, the engine, the tender, and the first couple cars would have brakes, and everybody else would slam in. This is how the train stopped. So you can understand why people got hurt. Now, one of the people who got hurt was Charles Dickens. He was in the Staple Hearst crash of 1865. This happened 
Um, and this is, from what I understand, a very accurate representation of what happens with, with the train. And of course, it became this tremendous spectacle. You see all these people down here in their top hats and dresses coming to look. Um, this happened about 70 miles southeast of London in Kent. And Charles Dickens was traveling with his mistress, Ellen Turnin. She was a cute little pretty um, actress. His wife was at home with the 10 children. Um, he, his, he, he, and when, when, when his, his entire um, carriage tipped over on its side. And so Charles crawled out, dragged Ellen out, dragged her mother out. And then he went around ministering to people and helping them. He had some, he got, he put some water in his hat. He had some brandy. He was doing what he could to help. Um, that evening, a express train was sent down from London, picked everybody up, brought them all back to London. He went home. He went to bed. And then the next morning he woke up and he was shaking so badly he could not sign his name. He developed tremors in his leg, feelings of paralysis, prickling, nightmares that were so bad that he would not go to bed. He would sit at his desk and he'd fall asleep at his desk. And he died five years to the day afterwards. And his son in his memoir said, my father never recovered. Well, when I read this account, I thought, okay, this sounds to me like what we'd call PTSD, right? Um, now, of course, they don't have that nomenclature. Um, but I thought, okay, well, what were they calling it? So I started doing some research into the history of this diagnosis. And most historians say that PTSD sort of began in World War I with shell shock, right? So shell shock was um, the, uh, this, this idea put forth in 1915 um, by a doctor named Charles Myers in The Lancet, which was sort of like the big medical journal at the time. And his idea was, you know, he saw these soldiers returning from the French trenches with terrible shakes, loss of speech, loss of hearing, loss of memory, um, an inability to speak, um, terrible nightmares. Um, but there seemed to be no clear ontology. So, but he theorized that what was happening is that a bomb would go off nearby and then the impact of it on the ground would cause small cuts and lesions in the soft matter of the brain. That was what they could kind of come up with to account for all of the symptoms all over the body. But I knew from my reading that 20 years before in the 1890s, Sigmund Freud and Joseph Breuer were working with patients, both men and women, with some of these exact same symptoms. Now they theorized it was a psychological basis, not a brain injury, and they called it hysteria. But as I started discovering, as I was reading around about accounts about railway injuries in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, all these same random symptoms were occurring in the aftermath of railway disasters, sometimes up to a month or two later. And with all of these various patients, what happened was a new form of medicine came into being called railway surgery. And these sympathetic railway surgeons called it um, various things, but many of them called it railway spine. The idea was that all the shaking that people experienced from being banged around those carriages would cause breaks or small lesions to form in the soft spinal matter. This is completely fictitious, but it was a story that could not be disproven. Nobody was going to open someone up to check. Now, the reason the story was so important is that Victorian travelers were allowed to sue the railway company for injuries, but under, under existing medical jurisprudence, victims could not get compensation for anything attributable to mere nerves or distress. The injury had to be organic, literally tied to an organ. Now, in turn, the railway companies hired their own medical men to discount railway spine. They declared these people were malingering to fetch money out of the deep-pocketed railway companies. And so the courtrooms became public spectacles, legal theaters for medical men and legal men to adjudicate injury. It set up two medical men as the stars of a show with serious emotional and financial stakes. And all of the trials were reported often verbatim in the newspapers. So there's this huge web of information about these railway crashes. Um, and the thing is, the trials were important, not just to the sufferers and not just to the railways, of course, who had you know, money at stake. It was also important to the medical men because at mid-century, medical men or medicine, the profession, was considered like this far above quackery. 
So these legal trials are an opportunity for them to get up and be important and be heard and explain their knowledge. And, um, and, and so it had very uh, personal stakes for them as well, for them and their profession. So this is where my dissertation began, with some short stories and letters by Charles Dickens, several Victorian novels with railway crashes, and some medical texts. Soon, friends and colleagues jumped on my train, and they were sending me poems about railways, short stories, parliamentary reports, treatises, letters, pamphlets, newspaper articles, opinion pieces, uh, music hall songs, and gravestones. I was inundated with more than I could possibly read about railway crashes. They were a national preoccupation, rather like COVID was for us for three years. But railway crashes went on for decades. So as I began to, as I was reading all this, I also began to realize that with all this printed matter, um, it created a, what I would call an intertextual web of languages, of language phrases, theories, and words that would serve as the foundation for Freud and Breuer 20 years later, for World War I doctors, and for us. For example, one phrase I encountered in newspapers was this, quote, this disaster is so horrifying as to be beyond description. Now, I also saw that exact same phrase in an eyewitness account in a parliamentary report. And then I saw a very similar phrase in two novels. And then I saw it in a medical treatise. But there, it was medicalized. It became a symptom. The idea that the trauma was so terrible, the injury was so terrible that they couldn't speak. These were people who could not speak of it. And the idea that the traumatic event is beyond description and unspeakable became a keystone of Freud and Breuer's ideas about repression. And it is still part of how we understand PTSD today. There's an injury that cannot be spoken. So in short, I came to see PTSD as beginning with the Victorians, because this is when a critical mass of people were coming together to talk and write about these injuries in a way that gave them medical, social, economic, and political meaning. Now, narrow as my dissertation necessarily was, and believe me, all dissertations are about this big, um, it led me to some bigger questions that were relevant not just for the Victorians, but for us. First and foremost, what counts as an injury? What diseases? are worth talking about, diagnosing, researching, and litigating? What's an injury worth in terms of the attention that we pay, um, but also the amount of money that someone should be compensated? Does it matter if you're a laborer earning three shillings a week or a lord with 30,000 pounds per year or a married Victorian woman who wasn't allowed to earn pro own property at all? And who gets to decide all this anyway? Does an experience rise to that tipping point of recognition because enough medical men and legal men are talking about it? And do they talk about it because they have an agenda? And does an experience matter because enough money is involved or because enough newspapers sensationalize it? More generally, how do we decide as a community what sorts of experiences are worth noticing? And what's fair and just in the face of human suffering? How do experiences gain and hold meaning in our world? And these are some of the themes spinning in the back of my mind as I turn to writing fiction. Part two learning to write a novel. I think one of the most important requirements for being a new author is being profoundly clueless about how hard it is going to be, how much rejection you will experience and how much there is to learn. When I finally got back to writing fiction in 2006, I had read hundreds of novels. I had published essays of literary criticism about novels in several respected journals and books. I taught courses about novels at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. I wrote introductions to novels for Barnes & Noble's classic series, but really I knew very little about writing a novel. I'd written a mystery before. When I was in my early 20s, it was sort of a mashup of Robert Ludlum and Helen McGuinness and an article I'd read in the New Yorker about Nazi war loot. It was terrible. It's in a drawer where it should be. But somewhere around 2006, we had recently moved to Arizona. And I, had, I was home with our two kids. My husband was traveling a lot and uh, Julia was six, Kyle was two, I was reading a lot of Goodnight Moon. I felt like my brain was getting a little mushy and I thought, okay, maybe I'll try and write a novel again. But what do I know about that hasn't been done a million times before? So I put Lady Elizabeth Fraser and her poor laudanum addicted mother on a railway crash in 1874, ran it off the rails, put on the railway train. And um, I know that none of you can guess where that idea came from. I finished a draft of it and sent out 50 query letters. 
And this was back when it was all pretty much done by snail mail. So you send out, you know, an, a manila envelope with like a cover letter and four or five pages or maybe a chapter. And then you go to the mailbox every day. It's kind of like waiting for a, a letter from a bad boyfriend or something. It's just, it's awful. And um, so every so often, you know, most times you get nothing. And then once in a while, I would get this thin envelope with like one third of a piece of paper that said, this is not suitable for us at this time. And I was so naive that I thought, well, maybe next year it'll be one. I didn't understand that this is like their way of saying, oh God, no. Um, so sometimes they'd sign it, usually they didn't. And mostly I heard back nothing. And I took some classes at ASU. I joined a critique group. Um, I rewrote it again and again, got sent out more queries, got more rejections. Um, I have to give my husband huge kudos here. He just kept saying to me, keep going, you're gonna figure this out. But at one point I did decide it was time to give up. Um, maybe I'd go back to grad school and become a therapist. I think that telling stories uh, in fiction and helping other people tell their stories are pretty related. But then I had this friend, Mame. Uh, she's a, she writes short stories, and she had just met a freelance editor named Maisie at a, at a conference and said, I think you should call her. And I said, well, okay. So I called, you know, and, and she said, yes, Mame told me you'd be calling. I could hear the, the, the sort of agony in her voice of having to tell me, like, I'm sorry, but your work is hopeless, and I, and I have to be nice to you because I like your friend. Um, but I said, you know, and she said, she called me about a week later and you know, I sent it to her and, I, and she said, call me a week later and said, you know what? I can help you with this. You've got good bones. You've got good character development. You've got some great historical stuff here. You know, we, we can, we can, we can work on this together. Um, and the first thing she had me do was take the first seven chapters of my book and throw them away. You see, I had a train accident, but it was in chapter eight. And uh, the first seven were a backstory about Elizabeth and her mother and their relationship from like childhood. I had a lot of really interesting stuff in there about railways and narrow gauges and wide gauges and spinal matter. And she said, yeah, this is, this is all fantastic, but it needs to be in your head. It does not belong on the page. Not like this. So, and I'm a pack rat and I find it very difficult to throw things away. So I took those first seven chapters and I put them in a file called dump. And I actually have one for every single novel I've written. It's this dump file where I pull stuff out because I'm like, huh, it doesn't really fit, but I'll stick it in here and maybe I'll use it somewhere later. So anyway, so I put everything in the dump file and we started working together. And really her clarity, her clarity about what belongs in my head as I'm writing and what belongs on the page um, that, that distinction was really helpful to me because I realized I, I needed to be thinking about books in terms of what other people are going to be reading. And so we talked, um, we worked together for about six months. Uh, we talked about the importance of an inciting event, like a railway crash, and escalating stakes. We talked about the balance of dialogue and description, about the difference between the character arc during which the main character changes and the plot arc, which pushes that change. We talked about secondary characters and how to make them round and interesting and how to use them to create conflict. And at the end of those six months, I had a different book. I sent out 10 queries. This time, fortunately, it was by email. And I got six people to write back and say, take a look. And I ended up with two offers of representation, which was great. Uh, one of the, and the agent that I eventually ended up with, his name is Josh Getzler. He's in New York. And I got his message. Uh, I was at Disney. So uh, do you remember the haunted house at Disney? Okay. And the first room drops. There's a, like this elevator that drops down. And I was in it with my husband and my two kids. I had my Blackberry and it went ding. And I open and I see that it's Josh saying, I would love to represent you. And I give this little hop on the elevator and people are turning around looking like, what are you trying to do? Break the ride? But I was too excited. Anyway, so Josh and I worked together. Um, we started working together. I guess that was in 2014. He said he loved the book, loved all the historical stuff, but he pointed out a couple of things. First of all, that I had a 16-year-old protagonist who was wrestling with some young adult themes like her identity and her relationship with her mother. But I had this plot about like parliamentary schemes and stock schemes and railway sabotage. Um, in other words, I needed to figure out what I was writing because you can't sell a book if it doesn't have a spot on the shelf. And by that, I mean, it has to fit into a genre pretty neatly, certainly for your first one. Um, second, he said gently, you still have a lot in here about railways. 
So I aged up my main character and I rewrote it yet again as an adult mystery. And I sacrificed some railway pieces. And then he sent it out to about 20 publishers under the title, The Viscount's Daughter. One day, it was a Friday, and Josh emailed me and said, wow, we have two publishers interested. They're going to go to their boards, um, and they're going to, um, you know, we'll see what happens. And, you know, that weekend, I was floating. I thought, oh, my God, my first book going to auction. This is so exciting. And then the following, like, week, uh, Monday after, he emailed me and said um, that both publishing houses had turned it down. They felt that the historical fiction mystery was that the, that whole genre was soft. It wasn't really selling. They had a couple of Victorian mysteries that weren't doing all that well. And Josh said there really wasn't anywhere else to go with it. I was pretty crushed for a few weeks. But I picked myself up and I fortunately was already kind of working on another idea based in part on the life of Charles Dickens' older sister, Fanny. Uh, she was a, a, a musical prodigy. Like she studied with one of Beethoven's students, like at the Royal Academy, like that kind of prodigy. Um, but the Dickens family was famously in and out of the poorhouse. And eventually they didn't have money for her tuition at the Royal Academy and she had to quit. So she left her music and she died young. And I thought this was this horrible story. And I wanted to write a story that had a happier ending. So instead of putting it in the 1820s, I put it in the 1870s where there were music halls. And music halls were great because they needed women performers. So this is, I can talk about it a little bit more in the Q&A if people want to know about music halls, because they're really outrageous places. It was the first place, as you can see both here and here, um, it was one of the first places where you could have dinner and watch a show. And if you didn't like what you saw, it was completely permissible to throw food at the stage. So so you see these, but and, and like, look at this woman. I, I, I just think she's amazing. Um, Anyway, so so this is so I, I started working on this book and I was about 40,000 words in and kind of writing along. And then Josh contacted me and said, hey, Grandpa Krishnan at Random House Hellbag, she wants your train wreck book. And this was really exciting because I thought, well, <laughs> um, yeah, this, this it, it will begin a whole new chapter of me learning about the book business, the business end of the book business, not the writing end. So one of the first things we had to do was change the name from the Viscount's Daughter because the marketing team didn't like it. They said it was too romancy, too bodice ripper, and it looked like Viscount and nobody would know how to pronounce it. So we went through, I'm not kidding, dozens of titles. I'd write some, uh, Josh would write some, we'd send them to Priyanka. Priyanka would pick her favorite. She'd send them to marketing. Marketing hated all of them. They'd come back with titles and, you know, and Josh would write to me like, this is terrible. And I mean, it, was, it went on and on. Eventually, Josh started calling it Choo Choo Go Boom. It's what he still calls it because he couldn't keep track of what title we were working. What was the working title at the time? Anyway, so Priyanka eventually came up with um, A Lady in the Smoke. So this was this was the first cover they sent over, and this is clip art. This is art that was that that someone found and said, "Oh, it's got a pretty girl. It's got a train. It's perfect." Well, the problem is, as I said to Josh, this train wasn't around until like 1915, and any woman who went out in that would be like it would be like you going out in your pajamas. You can't. Women did not walk around in like these little lacy things. This would been a, would have been a nightgown. So he said, okay, okay. He said, well, first of all, Karen, I, I get the whole pajama business. He said, but nobody's going to know that that train is a 1910 train except for you. And I'm like, I know, but I want it to be accurate. Anyway, so he goes back to Priyanka and she was very understanding. And I later found out that this is not usual. My friend Stephanie Pintoff has published five books. And when I told her this whole entire story about how I was asking for changes, she's like, are you kidding me? And I said, no, why? And she said, I get shown a cover and I am allowed to say one of two things. Wow, it's fantastic or wow, I love it. That's it. That's what I get. Anyway, so we go back to the drawing board and Priyanka said to me, okay, show me what you want. And so I said, okay, this kind of train is an 1870s train. They originally, this is just some fun, like silly facts, but there, oops, there were originally some rhinestones right here. And I was like, no, no rhinestones. You got to take the rhinestones off. Um, so they kind of did some moving around. Also, the train originally was, it's clip art, so it was turned the other direction. So when they flipped it, the numbers were backwards on the front. So the numbers were like three, four, one, and it looked like there was, it was like a mirror image. Anyway, so, so this is what we eventually ended up with. 
And right around the time this book was published, um, the the alibi said uh, we want to do a big promotion for it, and and they did. The, they and I ended up. They did a big bookbub Kindle. I don't know what all they did, but they um, they put it on sale for I think a dollar ninety nine, and it sold thousands of copies, and it ended up for one week on the USA Today bestseller list, which is exciting. And I remember looking at the list and I was like number 90 something or whatever. And my daughter leans over um, and she's like, look, mom, you're three ahead of the SAT review book. And I was like, like, I made it. Anyway, <laughs> so they, they and this and, and this was, you know, all very exciting and all. But then Priyanka contacted me one day and said, hey, I just want to let you know, I am leaving Random House to move over to HarperCollins. And on the strength of my first few book sales, she took me with her and got me a two book deal. I finished the music hall story, which became a dangerous duet. Um, this is the Italian translation. I always think it's very interesting to see the translations and the covers that other countries will put on your book. This is marketed in their romance um, books. Um, and then my work at Christie's helped me write this one, A Trace of Deceit. Um, in each book, a young woman protagonist is lured into a mystery because someone she loved is injured or killed. And I began with one aspect of Victorian culture, the railways, the music halls, the art and auction world, um, and then based my heroines on stories of real Victorian women. And I might have happily gone on writing these books, except that Priyanka left HarperCollins for her dream job at Hachette, doing young adult fantasy, which I don't write. In this industry, this what happened to me is called being orphaned. Um, as you might expect, after my two book contract at HarperCollins, they said bye bye, and I was sort of set back on my heels. And I thought, what do I do next? So I talked to Josh, and he said, "Remember that book you were telling me about? Something about dead girls in boats and an inspector and revenge and something. I don't know." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And he says, "Okay, write that." He says. I think I can sell that. I said, okay, fine. Now, unlike the others, this book did not begin with an aspect of Victorian culture. It began with an article I read about race and the law in the contemporary United States. The article included a story about a young black woman in Alabama who was jaywalking across a quiet street. A car came flying around the corner and hit her. And the driver was white, male, wealthy, and under the influence of alcohol. The injuries put her in the hospital for months. And when her family sued on her behalf, the judge in Alabama gave her $2,000 because she was jaywalking, ostensibly. Now, there's all kinds of things wrong with this story. But what struck me was that in the aftermath, the girl's father threatened the judge's daughter. And I thought, why did he do this? And I, 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 it really pulled me up short. I, and, I, and I started thinking about it. And because it seemed to me he wanted the judge to understand what it was to almost lose a child. In some twisted form, what looked on the surface like revenge was a, 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 a twisted form of communication. It was, a, it was an attempt to elicit empathy and understanding, to make someone understand who was refusing to understand what had happened. And I wanted to write a book about this, about pain and failures of empathy and revenge. But I wasn't 10 pages in before I realized I couldn't write using an amateur woman sleuth. I needed a man. So perhaps this is the only time in my life I will say this. Uh, I needed a policeman specifically because I was dealing with judges and juries and lawyers and corrupt witnesses. And these were all men in Victorian London. But, however, in the 1870s, the police in the yard were in a sticky spot. So just to give you a little backstory about the police, the Metropolitan Police Force was formed one year before the rocket went from Liverpool to Manchester in 1829 by Sir Robert Peel. And the Robert is why they're called Bobbies. The police rose simultaneously with the railways and also caused great anxiety for the British public, who had seen what happened in France when there was what they considered a police state, when the police could grab people off of streets and throw them in jail willy-nilly. So the London uh, populace had, um, they staged demonstrations against having police. 
So Robert Peel um, decided that he would do what he could to reassure them. And the way he would do this is through the uniform. Now, British military uniforms, as I'm sure all of you know, are red. They have epaulets. They have brass. They are big helmets. They carry guns. And he decided, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to put them in blue swallowtail coats like gentlemen wear. Very minimal amount of brass. And we're going to put them in top hats instead of helmets. And we're going to have them carry truncheons instead of guns. They, we are here to help. That was the message he wanted to get out there. Now, um, what you can't really see from this picture is that the hat is actually reinforced with cane. So it could serve as a stepping stool to look over the high London walls. And the brim is reinforced like hard enough that you can use it as a weapon. It will break someone's nose. So, but it looks polite. So the plainclothesmen began, um, these, this is actually a uniform constable. So like Michael Corvin, when he becomes a policeman in Down a Dark River, you know, 12 years before Down a Dark River begins, he has run to Lambeth. He joins up, he becomes a uniform constable. This is what he would look like. Um, but the uniform, um, there were uniformed men throughout London from 1829 on, but beginning in about 1842, there were plainclothes men, um, people who were not wearing uniforms. And the division that became known as Scotland Yard was born then in 1842. They actually drew some of the plainclothes men together. Some of them they left in the divisions and some of them they brought to Fort Whitehall Place, which is where Scotland Yard was based. Now, we tend to think of the yard as the elite division, sort of the ones you pull in for the hard cases. But in 1877, the yard was nearly shut down because of a huge scandal. Four senior yard inspectors were tried and convicted of taking bribes from con men. And these were not the junior guys. These, the, all of these men had at least 15 years of experience, which kind of makes you wonder what else they were up to in the meantime. And the trial was held here in the Old Bailey, which occupies a spot like kind of between London City and Westminster. This is the Victorian's version of Judge Judy. So it is, it, mobs would gather around it. The courtroom looked like this. And this doesn't even show you that there's a balcony up above that the public could come in and they would crowd in and they could offer their opinions on what was happening below. So this is one, this is the trial of the detective. This is one of the detectives who's, who's being examined there in the witness box. And the trial went on for five weeks and every London newspaper was carrying, I mean, this was the big story. This is every London newspaper was carrying the story. Um, a lot of them were printing headlines like, you know, uh, closed Scotland Yard. Um, the, the general opinion was that we would all be safer if all the yard men were at the bottom of the Thames because plain clothes allow them to conceal their evil deeds in plain sight. So, enter Sir C.E. Howard Vincent. So, Parliament decides, okay, we're going to shut the yard. Um, it, 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 nobody trusts it anymore. They're not good people. They, they don't accomplish anything. Um, but this guy, he's the second son of a baronet. He's a real person. Um, he was educated privately. He spoke, I believe, three or four languages. He was the journalist for the Daily Mail newspaper. He was 31 years old, and he went over to France, and he interviewed the French police and said, how do you do this? What do you do? Do you use fingerprints, or do you use physical descriptions, or do you use measurements of the head? You know, how do you get, you know, how do you um, manage to get um, um, confessions from people? Do you listen in? Do you have secret rooms? Like, he, he, did, he did a whole thing, and he came back to Parliament and said, I think I can clean up the yard. Now they looked at him and they said, okay, first of all, you've never solved a case. You've never served in uniform. You would be supervising people who are older than you for the most part and had come up from like Lambeth and Bethnal Green and I mean, some really sh like shady places in London. And he says, no, no, I really think I can do this. Anyway, he had this fabulous report that he presented and they're like, okay, give it a shot. And he did. I mean, he's kind of one of the great unsung Victorian heroes. He cleaned up the yard. He wrote a 300-page police procedure manual. He lobbied very hard to get um, the, to raise the salary to a living wage. I mean, part of the reason these guys had taken bribes was because they couldn't make a living as a policeman. So he was he so he so he did all of this. 
And he's part of the reason that the yard is the respected division it is now. Now, as those of you who've read Down in Dark River or Underveiled Moon know, he is the supervisor for my protagonist, Inspector Michael Corbin. Corbin is a former thief and dock worker, also a bare knuckles boxer, which was very illegal. He grew up in the rough neighborhood of Whitechapel, which is where the Jack the Ripper murders happened in the 1880s after he'd left. And he's Irish in a time when there was a lot of anti-Irish prejudice. And when I talk about racism, and I use that term advisedly, it is not marginal. Benjamin Disraeli, who later became prime minister twice, wrote in the London Times, again, not a marginal paper, quote, the, it, the Irish hate our order, our civilization, our enterprising industry, our pure religion. This wild, reckless, indolent, uncertain, and superstitious race have no sympathy with the English character. That is just part of the letter. So Corvin is up against a lot of discrimination as well as his poverty. And when he's 19, he flees Whitechapel. And when we meet him in Down and Duck River, he's risen, from, he's risen from uniformed constable in Lambeth to an inspector at the yard. As Down and Duck River begins, just after the trial of the detectives, the yard is under intense scrutiny, as you can imagine. Corvin is handing out a case of a beautiful young woman, the daughter of a prominent Mayfair family, who has been murdered and put in a lighter boat and sent floating down the Thames. He thinks he's discovered the motive, which is of theft. There was a necklace she was wearing. Um, but then a second young woman appears, and then a third. And I'm not going to do any huge spoilers here, but in the climactic scene, he faces the villain on Blackfriars Bridge, a Victorian bridge, where the villain explains what he's done and why. And in the end, Corvin must balance two valuable principles, mercy and justice. In the sequel, Under Veiled Moon, Corvin investigates a steamship disaster based on a historical event that happened in September 1878. So I didn't know until I really started researching the Thames and the boats on the Thames and maritime traffic that steamships, um, I always kind of thought of them as American, you know, like Tom Sawyer, you know, Mark Twain, kind of thing. There was, there was a small group of passenger steamers that um, were pleasure steamers, kind of like our hop on hop off buses. So for two shillings, you could bring your family and hop on right there at London Tower Bridge, right? It was called Swan Pier. Hop on, and then you take the take you know take a steamship down, hop off, have a picnic, hop back on, go down a little further, go to the North Sea, get off, walk the beach, maybe do some archery, see a show, hop back on, and then you come up the south side of the Thames by moonlight. And on September 3rd, the Princess Alice is coming around Tripcock Point. It's a blind curve. It's this little wooden steamer. And a 900-ton iron-hulled coal carrier called the Bywell Castle is coming downstream with the tide, because the tide is moving fast. It's coming down, rams into it, breaks it into three pieces. All 650 people are in the water, and over 550 die. And the problem is that nobody knows who's on the boat. It's hop on, hop off. So... You have family and friends and relatives desperately hunting for survivors and then desperately hunting for bodies. And the problem is the bodies were scattered all over the south side, all over the north side. And an old, old law said you could not take a corpse from one county to another. So you couldn't take it from Kent into London. So people were going, literally having to traverse the river looking for their loved ones, and then coming back. It was, it was horrifying. The whole thing was horrifying. Anyway, this is this is one of the representations. So this here is that over there is the Bywell Castle, and they were the people on the Bywell Castle were trying to help. I mean, they were throwing lines, they were throwing over preservers, um, and and anything that would float, um, but it didn't really help. So what ends up happening is in my novel. Um, now history tells us that it really was an accident. The Bywell Castle was going too fast. The Princess Alice was in the wrong place. But in my novel, um, I chose to kind of link it up to what was going on in, in terms of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which at that time was trying to get Irish Parliament pulled back out of British Parliament in London and brought back to Dublin so they could rule, they could run their island responsibly. Um, and they were using bombs and things to try and bring this about. So in my novel, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, a radical group, um, is initially blamed by all the newspapers. And Corbin must again balance two worthy principles, loyalty to his Irish friends and family and his duty to find the truth. 
And this brings me to the last part of my talk. Number three, why is historical fiction valuable now? One of the questions I'm asked sometime is, why don't you write about World War II? The implicit phrase left off that question is, like everyone else. My agent says, World War II is an easy sell to editors. Editors say World War II books hit the bestseller lists. And booksellers say readers love spunky World War II women spies. And I get it. I mean, some of my favorite books of all time are set in World War II, Codename Verity, All the Light We Cannot See, Night, The Book Thief. Um, but I want to share with you my hypothesis about why World War II is so compelling. It is the last time in our world that there was a bright, shining line dividing good from evil, with Hitler and the Nazis on the other side for most people. That sharp binary is compelling and narratively powerful because in fiction, when we see the line threatened, and then reestablished, it's satisfying, right? It's neat, it's tidy, it's reassuring. The Victorian era, frankly, is messy. It is a world that is not neatly divisible in any way that I have been able to see. Against the backdrop of rising literacy rates, of the growth of trains and telegraphs, which changed England forever, and changes in the voting rolls, and changes in laws, and the changes in the status of women and children and lower and middle and upper classes, everything was fluid. It was totally untidy and sort of like my office and my kids were the ones who made me put this one in here. So there's my office. So look how neat this is though, right? This is neat. It's pretty neat. I cleaned it up for you. Anyway, but that's that over there, that's my office. Um, generally speaking on the left-hand side, you see my 1870s map of London and then you see my, the rest of it. Now, part of the reason I love the Victorian era is that elements of it do resonate with aspects of our world today, not only in the mess, but how we've experienced a fallout from a major sea change, the internet, that restructured virtually every aspect of our society. Like Victorians, we have ongoing discussions about injury and pain and compensation and racism, injustice, power struggles, gender inequality, and the power of media storms. Historical novels can show us how the Victorian world has parallels with our own, which is interesting. But I would venture to say it can do even more than that. One of my favorite quotes is from the 13th century Persian poet Rumi, quote, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. I like thinking about this field. I believe that historical fiction is a peculiar, unique potential. When the world inside the novel and the world in which that novel is being read are markedly different, say set apart in time and location, it creates a space somewhat like Rumi's field where rightness and wrongness are not the primary concern. It creates an imaginative space where we can symbolically explore issues such as inequality and racism and misinformation storms without being weighed down by what Jill Lepore recently called, quote, the leaden passions of the present. This field I envision is a place of curiosity rather than judgment, a place that is expansive and complex rather than narrow and binary, a place shaped by structures of both and instead of either or, a place that makes space for both mercy and justice, both loyalty and duty. It allows us to balance the values and imperatives that pull on us all. Mysteries would seem to be a peculiar genre to choose for this because by their very nature, they're somewhat binary. There's a villain and a detective. But even in this genre that pits evil against good, a villain is not a villain in his own head. And in good mysteries, we see that a villain has a logic for his actions. He has a frame of reference and a justification for his behavior. Now, this is a silly little cartoon. It's one I use in my writing workshops. I like it because the elements are just letters, right? Neither one is better or worse than the other. They're just different. And it suggests to me how important it is that we consider other people's vantage points and how they influence how people make meaning out of what they see and experience. And novels, which are about characters who approximate real people, compel us to do this by their very nature. When we read, we are temporarily putting ourselves in the main character's shoes, following his or her thoughts, feeling what he or she feels, Recent scientific research has shown that reading strengthens the empathy loops in our brain. It doesn't take a degree in neuropsychology to understand why. I believe at the core of most books is an emotional truth. 
Now, I'm not sure every novelist works this way, but usually I don't recognize the core emotional truth that is making its way into a book until after I finish my first draft. For example, with A Trace of Deceit, it began as a mystery about the art and auction world with a woman whose older brother is a gifted forger and gets murdered. But it's really about my father, who was a gifted pianist um, and who died in 2012. And it's partly about how giftedness, while wonderful, can structure families in some problematic ways. There's a similar emotional core at the heart of Underveiled Moon. My son, Kyle, had just left for college. He's down at U of A in Tucson. And perhaps inevitably, my husband and I were talking about things we wished we'd done as parents, as people. Quote, sometimes I wonder how we all live with the stupid stuff we've done, George said to me. I leapt up from the couch, actually, and scurried off because I had to write that line down because it felt like that is what Corvin is thinking and feeling. Regret was his core issue, and my husband had sort of nailed it. Considering that Corvin is my invention, you'd think I'd know this. When Michael Corvin left Whitechapel, he was fleeing a violent and corrupt boxing hall owner who wanted to kill him. In running, he left behind his adoptive brother, Colin, an eight-year-old boy who idolized Michael. Michael didn't realize how living without an explanation would hurt this little boy. He didn't look back. He was 19. He was fleeing for his life. But now he regrets it because Colin's hurt has scabbed over in a way that has become self-destructive and dangerous. The thing is, when I went back through my first draft, I realized the villain had regrets, which drive him. Corvin's adoptive mother, Ma Doyle, has regrets. So do most of the characters. In fact, I found shades of regret in almost every chapter. And I thought, oh, Karen, were you working something out? Regret is profoundly human and quite universal. So while it looks like a mystery about a steamship disaster, at its core, Underveiled Moon broaches the question, what do we all do with regret? The mistakes we make that we can't fix. The injuries we cause, even without meaning to. How do we live with ourselves and use regret to help us move forward? You see, I've circled back to injuries. But in writing this book and seeing how Coravin, with the help of his friends, inches towards some answers, I came to think deeply about the importance of being grateful when the universe grants us grace, when it and the people around us who love us allow us to outgrow our younger selves. For isn't that a valuable purpose, to grow and learn and help each other along? So I will close with another of my favorite quotes from Rumi. We are all just walking each other home. Thank you. That's the end. I think there's one more. Okay, now it's not working. Hmm. I don't know if we can maybe advance to the next one. It's just it's just the one with my slides on it. Hmm. Oh, wait. Oh, there we go. Oh, I see. Yeah. Didn't get to the end. There we go. Yeah. Yep. Oh. There we go. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It really wants you to fix those in. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, so <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Stop, please. Okay. Anyway, um, so does that mean? Does that um so uh but anyway so thank you very much for being here. Do you, does anyone have any any comments, questions, anything they want to know more about or yes, Leah? Karen, coming up. So uh at the moment, uh, Crooked Lane has not given me a contract for my third book in the Corbin series. So I started working on um about three years ago, I had written a book. Um, that then I put aside when I got the Corvin series started. And this book is about um, it's about a young woman named Gwendolyn Manning in 1872 in London. And her best friend from childhood, Louis Ainsley, is a political economist who goes to Africa with Henry Morton Stanley in 1871 
and returns with a story about slaves and ivory that no one in London wants to hear. So he is murdered um, halfway through writing. He starts writing a book and he's murdered. And she and his younger brother um, want to not just find out why Lewis was murdered and who did it, but also they want to find his book, which has gone missing, because they want to make sure that the world hears what he has to say about what's happening in Africa. Um, I became interested in this. I read this book. I don't know if anyone's read it. It's called King Leopold's Ghost. Oh my God, this book is harrowing. And Le King Leopold, I mean, he, he ranks right up there with Hitler. He really does. He is horrifying. Um, and and so one of the practices that he would use in, in, in he, he, he wanted to uh, colonize parts of Africa. And one of the practices that he would use to gather rubber in the 1890s, which was a hot commodity because people were using bicycles and cars and the whole bit. Um, what he would do is his agents would go into a African village. They would, they had a stockade that they basically brought with them. They would put the stockade up, take the women and the children and stick them in the stockade and then say to the men, you go bring me 30 pounds of rubber. Um, and until you do that, your, your, your wife and your children are going to be without food and water in this stockade. That was how they were harvesting rubber. And I thought, like, I, I, I just, that just like, I don't know, it just devastated. I, I was just speechless reading this. And there was a lot of other stuff in there too. And, and so I thought, you know, I really feel like I want to write a book about um, how, about Britain's very, very complicated relationship with Africa. Um, they weren't, I mean, it's the, you know, King Leopold was Belgian, um, but, you know, I, you know, there's this history of exploitation, but it's not as simple as I thought it was. One of the things I found out, for example, is that, um, you know, long before uh, Henry Morton Stanley showed up in 1871, there were 450 years of Arab slavers who were taking slaves, I mean, thousands and thousands of slaves each month through the slave, um, the slave market on the east side of Africa. I mean, I had always heard about the West, you know, all the, all the slaves coming over from the Western part of Africa into the Americas and Jamaica and the slave plantations and the sugar plantations and things. There was this incredibly huge and, and, and almost like perfectly systematized um, slaving going on on the east side as well. And so I, I wanted to I wanted to just kind of get into that a little bit. So that's that that is that's the book that I'm working on right now. I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. I don't know, but I I feel like it's a story I want I want to get out there. So yeah. Anyone else? Mm -hmm.